sanitize my hands. So if I do shake your hands, you ought to be okay. Um, the, the outline for today, uh, I'm Tim Drury, I'm with Liz McKnight, and I've been in risk management for local governments for over 20 years. What that means is I have worked with local governments in Illinois and Indiana in ways to reduce the risks to your exposure, as well as, oh, okay, all right, because I can shout. Oh, okay. Um, as well as when you do get sued, risk management helps it so that you are better in a better position to defend yourself from lawsuits. Um, I was giving a presentation one time, and I was talking a lot about different ways that local governments could win the lawsuits. And um, afterwards, someone came up to me and said, you kind of sounded cold-hearted. Um, like, well, we can do this, but then we won't get in trouble for that. And I said, no, no, no. So let me, the, the basic tenet of risk management is not to cause harm in the first place. But as you know, anybody can sue anybody for anything. So what we have to do realistically is, as governments, as targets of lawsuits, is be prepared for those. So I'm. I'm going to assume that most of you are not sexually harassing your employees, that you're not terminating them illegally, that you're not hiring illegally, and that you don't have illegal employment practices. So let's just say that from the outset. I'm not trying to cover up illegal activities. A um, couple, couple different things that I'm going to be doing. I've got three different presentations here. One, I'd like to scare you. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some employment practice statistics. What are the odds of you getting sued? If you do get sued, what are the costs associated with that? I want to talk about some risk management practices. What things can you do within your county government to, to what practices can you do to stop employment practice claims and lawsuits? And um, then lastly, I'm going to wrap that up with a uh, Jeopardy game. Um, with prizes. Uh, I was I told Christina, I said, I'm not gonna give prizes to people who are sitting in the first two rows though, so, you know, so I gotta throw this candy and I might knock somebody's eyes out. Um, as you came in, I did have some uh, educational bulletins. Uh, please help yourself. I'm not gonna be talking from these specifically, but they're pretty good. Uh, excellent writer. Um, I do want to talk about a couple different things just so you, you, you pick them up. Um, one of my favorites is called Can I Be Sued? As uh, elected officials, uh, they typically like to know how can I be sued, how does insurance fit in, what's, what's the arrangement between the county, the county's insurance, indemnification, paying for defense, that type of thing. Read that. Good stuff. Uh, the other one. It's just a nice jet. It's called Local Officials Sued for Wrongful Termination. It's really good information on um, kind of generically where are litigation landmines, where do we see employment practice claims, uh, what are the costs, what are some common mistakes. Very simple, very, very easy, breezy stuff. Um, this one, Cultivating an Environment of Respect in the Workplace. It's kind of a different um, focus in, in risk management for us. Um, one of the ideas that, that we're proposing here um, is, is really different. As I said, sometimes people kind of think that we, we talk in a lot of legalese and risk management, and it seems like we're talking a lot about defending ourselves when we're in trouble. And the Cultivating an Environment of Respect is a program that we have. It's a, it's a, a program we put on, and it talks about in the your employment the culture of your employment and and the idea that harms in the workplace don't happen like big car crashes boom and the big damage gets done occasionally they do but but that harms in the workplace are happen drop by drop little by little it's small inequities that people say and people do uh, sometimes we don't even think that they're negative but they have negative consequences it's a really cool it's kind of a Think of it as a, um, I don't like to say diversity, because diversity is almost too, too narrow, uh, but more of a, uh, an awareness of how our actions and our behaviors can, it can affect people in the workplace. Um, so it's, it's kind of cool. Take a look at that. It's 
pretty interesting um, stuff. All right, so I'm gonna try to do the scaring part. What are, these are, these statistics are a couple years old, but you know, they just keep going up. What are some median awards? You know, this is the, mid, the average award for age discrimination, 266,000. Race discrimination, 150,000. Sex discrimination, disability, uh, discrimination, other types. <clears throat> oh, shoot. I want to go back. Sexual harassment, 125,000. Wrongful termination, 175. Retaliation. As you can see, it's pretty expensive. These things, uh, these are just the awards, okay? I asked somebody once, so you know, what, what do you see when you look at this? And they said, don't discriminate people who are older, because those that's the most expensive. <laughs> no, your takeaway here is that the awards themselves are very expensive. But not just the award, we also have the, the fees associated with those awards. $44,000 is the average legal fee for all litigated cases, and that's including those with the defendant's win. Keep in mind, the defendant doesn't always win. Sometimes the employer wins. One third of awards when the defendant loses involve punitive damages. By the way, the defendant would be you. So a third of the time, if the employer loses, there's also, oh, oh, there's also damages called punitive damages. And more often than not, your insurance company cannot pay the punitive damages. By statute, punitive damages are there to punish the evildoer. Yeah, that's you. You're the evildoer. Um, so in addition to the compensatory damages, there may also be punitive damages, and then you also have the legal fees. So it's just adding all up. Lots of times, counties say, well, wait a minute. You know, we're pretty small. I don't, I don't think, you know, that hasn't happened here. I don't think it's going to happen here. We all get along pretty well. Statistically, 41% of all employment practice liability claims are brought against small employers, 15 to 100 employees. Um, and again, that, that other statistic that I had said 44,000 was defense. This says that the def average defense can range from about 41,000 to 126,000 just to get to a verdict. So just to prove that you're right can cost you forty to one hundred and thirty thousand um, dollars. I was doing a lot of research before I came and, to, to, and talked about this, and I, I had all these charts and graphs. And I didn't want to bore you with them, but it came, boiled down to this: as an, as unemployment rises, so do EEOC claims and employment practice lawsuits. So right now, when we have high unemployment, we have higher claims. In fact. Um, there, there was, um, in 2008, uh, that was the highest number of EEOC claims that the, that the EEOC had ever had since it was born. And um, we've, we beat that in 2013. I didn't have this, the direct numbers, but I don't think it mattered. The, the bottom line is, when the economy goes south, EEO, the claims and employment practice claims go up. And that's, where, that's the environment that we are in today. In asking jurors, so what's your, what's your perception of employers versus employees? And 61% said that it's important to send a message to employers that they need to improve their behavior. 68 said they would want to award punitive damages if an employer was found guilty. Okay, this is, this is okay stuff. If you're guilty, fair, fair, fair is fair. Now let's see if there's a little bit of bias. 75% said they would tend to believe a woman who says she's been sexually harassed at work. This was irregardless of what the facts themselves said. They said they would tend to believe that if someone came forward with an allegation of sexual harassment, they would tend to believe it. There were other statistics, and I'm not, I'm not trying to diminish anything, but um, as it went on, basically the jurors said that they would believe if someone came forward with an allegation that they would, they would just tend to believe that from the offset. And I think that's because we, as employers, need to remember how you view yourselves 
Jimmy Stewart, right? I mean, just this man was so honest. He was he, fair. But how do employees tend to view us? You're the pigs. You guys are always wrong. Um, it, it, so there is a you need to know going into the box that you're there's a bias against an employer. And sometimes you, it's, I think it's interesting because you you wear you know a dual hat. I'm sure you feel like an employee too, but employee when you are dealing in the employment practice arena you are talking about the county as an employer so what are some things that impact your um, employment practices uh, where where can you where, where can liability attach so to speak well there are so many different laws that it is pretty impossible how many folks in here have a HR background. You came from HR. Can, can, can you keep your hand up? Because I can. Oh, okay. So there's there's quite a few. And how many don't then? It's okay. Even with an even with an HR background, new laws keep being added, and once those laws are added, they continue to change too. Let's FMLA. FMLA has been expanded. March of this year, there were new provisions added. Um, FLSA. Uh, the Employee Polygraph Protection Act, Whistleblower Statutes, Title VII of Civil Rights, Age Discrimination, ADA, then we have the ADA, AA, correct? That was the, the additions. Immigration Reform, the list goes on. So what are some common law actions that can be taken against employers? Anything from an assault and battery to defamation, negligent hiring, invasion of privacy, false imprisonment, there's lots of different ways that as an employer you can get caught up in litigation. So a lot of employers say, but we've, we've never had any problems in the past. We've always gotten along really well. Well, is your past going to guarantee your future? Consider that just recently the Civil Rights Acts of 1991 has been expanded, Family Medical Leave Act, as I said, expanded, and the ADA just recently expanded. Um, we do things right. If somebody sues, they won't have a leg to stand on. Keep in mind, as I mentioned before, in addition to even an honest mistake, you're going to have your legal fees, you might have to pay your plaintiff's legal fees, and any settlement to a potential employee, if you, even if you make a mistake. One of the things that as an employer you need to consider is you're trying to prove a negative. We didn't discriminate. We didn't negligently fire somebody for, for some type of legitimate non-discriminatory business reason. You want, that's, you're you're going to be trying to prove a negative, prove something that didn't happen. And it's going to be a jury of your employees' peers, not yours. They're not going to have employment people up on the jury. They're going to have just regular folks who, as I said, already have a skewed view towards you as an employer. So are you able to answer yes to these questions, to, to be immune from employment practices liability? Do you know all employment law, how to comply with every responsibility these laws put on your shoulder? Are you informed of every change? Are you certain that juries never have inconsistent verdicts? Are you able to say that you are complying with all FLSA regulations? Kent Irwin is going to be the next speaker, and I think maybe many of you have heard Kent speak before. You've had an opportunity to work with him. A lot of counties work with his firm. Um, and Kent's going to be talking about FLSA because there's been a growing number of inconsistencies, cases and settlements where there's been problems with documentation and paying with counties and employees. So that, that's, a, that's a, it's such a big component that Kent's going to talk about that separately. Um, this is actually a little bit old. I'm complying with all 75 pages of the FMLA regulations. That's grown. I didn't even change that. Uh, can you guarantee that none of your employees will ever make a comment to another employee that's sexually, racial, racially, or religiously offensive? 
your employees never misbehave, they never want time off for personal reasons, and you've never terminated anyone over 40. Your employees always agree with you when you fire them or lay them off. Your employees are always satisfied with raises and promotions. My point in this little session, this little segment here, is that you can employ, you've, you've got a target on your back as an employer. As a county employer, folks think that you guys have a pot of money and they want to go after that. The, the environment is, uh, employment environment is bad, so people don't feel that they have a lot of options. So if they tend to feel that they've been fired or didn't get that raise or promotion, they, they don't have a lot of options. They can't get a lot of jobs other places. So they're looking for redress through you. Um, so from a risk management perspective, we say you can control your, your exposure to those liabilities through risk management. What types of activities do we want to see counties doing? We're looking on the hiring side for training and documentation. Hiring is... Um, it's, it's, a, it's much trickier than, than folks think. And I wanna, I'm gonna jump for one second. I apologize, I don't have this handout with me, but I will have that emailed to uh, Christine and she'll make that available to you. How many of you have other people involved in the hiring process? So other folks do the, do the actual interview questions and things like that. Um, what we find is that oftentimes those folks are, are don't they're not aware of some of the things that they're saying and some of the things that they're doing so we I have a list I have a nice handout that has a number of illegal employment questions and then how to phrase that in a legal way so in other words if you want to ask I, I, I don't think it's a it's appropriate but here so you can't say to somebody are you a US citizen what you just really need to say is are you authorized to work in the United States you just you need to make sure, and actually you're doing the I-9 form anyway. Um, you want to say, how old are you? you? If there's a legitimate reason for you knowing, you can say are you over the age of 18, if, if that's a requirement of the, of the job. Um, you can't, it, people, people make mistakes, and they, they don't realize when they're asking the question that it actually has an illegal tinge to it. So they might say, when did you graduate from college? Irrelevant. It, it could be on the resume anyway. But since that can indicate age, um, you, you're not allowed to ask a question like that. That's kind of news to people who are doing some of your interviews. My suggestion is, is that you give a form to the folks who are doing interviews, and you prescribe some questions for them, or you do some training with them on how to do questions. Um, for instance, are you married? Do you have kids? Seems like normal questions. You want to find out about that person, but you can't ask that. So you need to ask questions like, um, the job requires overtime occasionally. Are you, would that be a problem for you? you? So you can't say, do you have appropriate child care? It's, it's tricky. And it's much trickier to somebody who is not schooled in the fact that if somebody does not get a job, and they feel that the question that was asked was illegal, they're gonna be able to have a lawsuit against you. And they're gonna ask for the documentation of what were the questions. And it would be great if you could say, this is our interview application form. This is the script that our interview, that our, the folks who interview, this is the script that they go off of, and here's the documentation that they use when they, make, when they take that interview. And, and please script some of your folks 
on what the answers are. are. Um, don't be doodling just anything that pops into their head. Um, you know, this guy's way too old for this job. We really have 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 got to do a better job in in making sure that's a legal situation. When you are having someone interview somebody, you're putting them on the front lines of a potentially dangerous situation, very volatile. Make sure that that is, a, that is as controlled as it can possibly be. I, I, so there, there is a way to take the need for information and put it into a legal format. Christine, I'll make sure that I get this. I'll get this to you. Ah, shoot. So you're, you're not allowed to say to somebody, do you have disabilities? You say, here's the job description. Are you able to perform the essential functions of the job? Yeah. It's actually up to them to tell you if they need a reasonable accommodation. You don't need to ask for that. You can't say things like, um, I actually saw a, a um, this was a while ago, but still. Um, in counties, I know, I know it's difficult because different, different people, there's different political um, kingdoms within the county. And somebody might say, well, this is our employment application, and this is our employment application, and this is our, and it's all siloed out. There ought to be a common application, and then there could be addendums to that. If it were, there, are, there are departmental needs that, that need to be done. There was a, uh, an employment application that was so old it had been copied and copied and copied and it just it absolutely looked horrible. And it asked things like, have you had a workers' compensation claim? What medical issues do you have? So on the, on the very face of this employment application, anybody who didn't get a job if they had that, that if they could get that application, they would have been able to walk into any bad attorney's office and say, "I want to sue them. I didn't get the job, and I didn't get the job because they asked me this illegal question." Even if they were the least qualified candidate on the planet, they would have had a cause of action against that employer because they had illegal questions on their application. And it's so simple. You can walk into a Staples. You can walk into an Office Depot and buy a legally vetted application. So that's, it's, that's just a, there's no excuse for having an illegal application. But you ought to make sure, when was the last time somebody's looked at the hiring process? Where are employment applications? If someone were to go to the auditor's office and say, we're hiring someone, where, where's that application? If someone were to go to uh, the clerk's office, where would that application be? If you have all these different things floating around, um, has somebody looked at all of that? It's a good reason to have an HR director at a county. All right. I'll jump back. Sorry, got off on my tangent on hiring. It's just that it's that's an easy one to it's an easy one to fix. It seems to me. Terminations. People don't like to be fired. So right off the bat, you have a contentious situation. We get into situations with, um, and I'm going to avoid, there's actually a new case that just came out that, he, that muddies the water even more in Indiana. I'm not going to talk about that. I think Kent might talk about that a little bit later. Uh, I was talking with David about that. Um, you ought to have some type of legal review or process to make sure that 
you, people know who are the appropriate folks that can terminate people. Um, and you'd like to keep um, people out of the process who shouldn't be in the process. I'm dancing around it. You, you, what you need to make sure is that you don't have um, county commissioners doing hiring and firing that should be done by somebody else. They should set policy and set direction for the county and others should carry out the actual work of the county. So if, you, if you're getting situations where you're getting pressure to do various things, um, pull in an attorney, pull in your county attorney or if you've got a, an HR consulting attorney, pull those folks in to help you make those terminating uh, decisions. There's a, uh, we used to talk about in Indiana, Indiana is an at-will state. Uh, what that means is there, the statute says, uh, I can fire you and you can quit. You, we, we, we at will. But there's so many things that complicate that issue nowadays. You've got collective bargaining agreements. You have um, retaliation, potential re retaliation claims. There's a number of things that you ought to do to make sure that when you are, you are terminating an employee, there's not a chance that it's going to ricochet back at you. Sexual harassment. Um, three things there. It's very, very simple. A policy, a procedure, and training. Many people have policies. They pull the EEOC policy right off the website and say, this is our policy. But it doesn't really, it doesn't really speak to what that county, what their, what their policy is. So you need to have a procedure. What's going to happen at your county who should the employees go to? Is it, what, what are the three positions that they can report to, or the 10 positions? Who are the folks that they ought to go to? And then you ought to train supervisors and managers on what to do if somebody has an allegation of sexual harassment, and you need to train the employees on what they are supposed to do within that policy. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that later. You need to look at your ADA compliance, your FMLA compliance, your COBRA compliance, and even your OSHA compliance. And there are folks who are able to do that for you. Um, you ought to be asking maybe your county attorney. You ought to be asking maybe your HR consultant. Uh, there, are, there are people who do this. You could ask your insurance company to come in and do a review on a various section for you. Make sure that you're in compliance. Think of it as an audit. People don't like that word on it, but you just you want somebody external to look at some of your processes. How about just simple simple stuff? Your posters are your posters up to date? You know, there are companies out there you 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 sign up and they send you new ones whenever the new ones come out. Um, when was the last time you had supervisory training on any issues? How about the big three: hiring, firing, and harassment and discrimination? Uh, when was the last time you you looked at your employment applications? And do you have job descriptions for your jobs? I can't imagine how you can have employees without job descriptions. If they get injured, how are you going to have them come back to work? Because don't you need to communicate with, the, with, their, with their physician with what the essential job functions are? How can a doctor release them to come back to work if they don't even know what they're going to be doing at, at that, that job? You know, and, and nowadays you can go online and find job descriptions for pretty much any job in the entire world and it'll be listing essential functions. It'll, it'll have the categories of lift never, often, frequently, 50 pounds, over 50 pounds, that type of thing. That's the information you need to have in addition to the we do this, we do this, we do this, and anything else that anybody assigns to us. Does your county do annual reviews? Anybody here do that? No. Um, they can be good and they can be bad. If an annual review is done poorly, it can be documentation that's against you. It would be better to not do an annual review. <coughs> it would better to it would be better to not have a bad annual review than no annual review. So I guess in the scheme of things, no annual review is better than a bad one. But think of what documentation that does provide you. 
if you have some type of annual review, so that what do, all of you, I'm sure, are, are familiar with employees where people say, well, you know that person stinks. You know that there are departments where everybody knows, don't give it to that, that guy because he'll do it four times slower than anybody else. If that is the case, if you had documentation, you'd be able to handle that in a disciplinary way, perhaps even resulting in termination. I think more and more counties that we're working with have employment manuals and have employment manuals that are up to date. Everybody here feel like you have a personnel policy manual? Again, if you don't, um, go to somebody who does. Find a county that does, pull theirs. Keep in mind that you can't just pull a, a personnel policy manual off the shelf and say, slap your name on it and say, there it is. Because there should be things in there that are very specific to you. It should outline departments, um, people to report to, um, processes for alerting someone about uh, harassment or discrimination, that type of thing. So you can't just take an off-the-shelf policy, but, but you can certainly get that and build from there. Most folks have some type of EEOC policy. Again, they pull it off and sometimes just three-hole punch it and put it right in their policy manual and say, well, there, there it is. But it, it really didn't come through their actual county. Uh, the, the, nobody looked at that. Nobody thought, well, how does that... How does that EEOC policy work here at our county government? Any questions on anything so far? I apologize for my voice. I had an idea that I was going to incorporate clips of the office into a PowerPoint presentation. And what I found was it was a heck of a lot harder than I thought. First of all, it's illegal. But I found a way around that because I went to Best Buy and I asked them how to do it. And they sold me this 200 and something dollar product that was going to help me do it and I, I could not figure out how to do it. So we don't have the office clips. but. Just know that if you ever want to learn about how to not have appropriate employment practices, you got to watch that show. I've talked about this already. With so many different laws, it's, it's all, I would say it's virtually impossible to be an expert in every area. Some of you might be. God bless you. Um, I don't feel that I am. I feel that I have access to good attorneys and good experts who help me along the path. I just want to know where those landmines are, and then I use experts to help me avoid those landmines. I want to talk about, so we, we own, Bliss McKnight, oops, sorry, I'm not going to do a, a commercial for us, but I just want to offer you a, couple, a little bit of insights. We only insure local governments, so that's the only thing we've ever done. So I want to give you our top three claims in employment practices. And employment practices is kind of a relatively new area of, of um, general liability claims. It used to be, in fact, it, it used to be just a part of general liability, meaning like if somebody sued the county, they, you'd look to the, your insurance policy and see where that fit in. And employment practice claims typically didn't fit in. Some did and some didn't. When you think about it, your general liability policies are designed to protect you from suits from third parties. Somebody sues you when they fall on your premises. They're not your employee. If your employee falls on your premises, they go through workers' compensation. If somebody gets hit by a county vehicle, it's your third party liability. Employment practices is different because it's actually your employee suing you. It's kind of odd. So the the I think one of the reasons we have good statistics on this is it's relatively new. So we don't have to go back all that far. We could go back to like the 90s and say, this is where a lot of this stuff came from. So our number one claim for local governments is harassment and discrimination. Two was hiring. People felt that they didn't get the job because of some illegal activity. 
and three was firing. So we can talk about a whole bunch of stuff. We can and should. But the three areas that you're most likely to be involved in litigation are going to be those times where you are uh, ale someone's alleging that you harassed or discriminated against them, negligent hiring, or negligent firing. Um, where does this come from? Where, where do, this, what do the allegations, how do they attach to you legally? You know, what's, what are the rules? Well, the rule book for you is going to be the Civil Rights Act of 1964, uh, the Civil Rights of 1991. They make harassment and discrimination illegal. Different states are actually expanding upon that. Different states are, are adding different classifications to protected classes. Um, I think it's Pennsylvania added a whole bunch of stuff, including discriminating in someone for... Um, how they put it, cellular proclivity to something. Basically meaning if I have a DNA test that shows that I am likely to get cancer, um, my employer can't discriminate against me. I don't know how you would know that I had had that testing done. But there's, a, there's some federal laws on that as well. Um, so what we're looking at is it, it's... In, it's in your best interest moving forward to look at job duties and applicability for employees to have those types of jobs. How you doing, Ken? Good morning. Good morning. So harassment or discrimination of any form, sexual, racial, age, national origin, religious, or because of a disability is unacceptable behavior for supervisors and employees. A lot of this became very prominent after the Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill hearings. Um, it was just interesting. It was, it was um, kind of our first foray into um, unscripted TV. It was before we had things like The Real World and The Bachelor. We had the Clarence Thomas and Anita Hill hearings, and everybody was watching them. So I said harassment and discrimination was the number one claim against local governments. So I want to talk a little bit about that because there's, there are some simple things from a risk management perspective that counties can do to, to either stop those claims or keep them, defend yourself when they do happen. There's two types of sexual harassment. There's quid pro quo, which is Latin for this for that. It's a real simple concept. You do this for me, I do that for you. This one gets more complicated for employers. They, they kind of have a little hard time wrapping their head around this issue. And that's a hostile work environment. And the reason it's probably as difficult for you to wrap your head around it is that um, it's a great concept, um, but it lets attorneys define this arena, which means we keep attorneys working. And God knows we don't want any unemployed attorneys. Hostile environment says sexual harassment can occur when coworkers or supervisors subject an employee to unwelcome sexual conduct, that don't need to be defined, right? Which unreasonably interferes with the employee's work performance or creates a hostile or offensive work environment. So that entire definition is gonna to continue to need clarification and case law so that people can keep saying, well, here's hostile, but here's not. So let's keep moving until we can kind of figure out where, where hostile becomes not hostile, let's, let's find that, that middle ground. From an, employee, from an employer perspective, this is a part for you. If the harassed employee did not suffer any detrimental employment action, that means you didn't fire them, you didn't demote them, and you tried to prevent the harassing behavior, that's, so you got to have those two hoops to jump through. And the employee didn't use the available preventive or corrective measures. In other words, they didn't follow your policy. Then you are able to deny or stop their claim. Okay, so those three hoops. So if the employee is still working for you and they're saying, I'm employee A and employee B has been harassing me. 
And w this is a typical scenario. The employee quits and then they file something with the EEOC and it comes to you. If you, this is, this is the catch though, if you have a policy and a procedure and that employee has been taught about that, so this is where you want to have that procedure and then the sign off saying that they got it, you're gonna, that's, that's gonna immediately stop their claim. It will not move further. That's your affirmative defense, all right? That's, in, in, in the world of, of harassment and discrimination, you don't have a lot of affirmative defenses. If something bad took place, you're pretty much gonna be on the hook. In this situation, in other words, employee B did indeed harass employee A. You're not denying that, you, but you, you know, this is, you can't control every, every word, every action of, of all of your employees. But if they didn't avail themselves, if they didn't follow your policy and procedure, you can stop that claim cold. That's why it's important for you to have this policy, train your supervisors, and train your employees. This just kind of makes simple sense. In terms of harassment, your liability for a coworker's harassment is going to be determined by whether you knew or should have known of the harassing conduct and failed to take corrective action. So I have a question. Have you ever been in a situation where an employee comes and says, hey, this is just off the record, but, and then they tell you some egregious thing that took place in the workplace? What's your responsibility at that point? Pardon me? Investigate. Investigate. Yeah, there, there, there isn't really off the record. It, it, when you're in the employer role, there, there isn't, um, hey, I don't want you to do anything, but this person did this to me or to that person or to that person. That's, that's you're on notice at that point. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit later about HR styles, but you, you, you can't have your friend hat on and say, okay, thanks for, thanks for letting me know. Geez, I know, isn't he a jerk? That's not helpful. So you, you can't do that. As I said, the affirmative defense is going to rely on your policy and your complaint procedure that the, um, that the, it's going to be important for both the employer and the employee. Trust me, it is more important to you, okay, as the employer. I think it's kind of funny when we do employment training, and if it's done properly, um, a lot of times people people get, they're, they're, I've had employers get fearful and say things like, well, we don't want to train our employees on how to file a claim. Like, yeah, you do. You do want to tell them. Because if they come to you and they say, this employee is doing this, it gives you an opportunity, opportunity to put a stop to it. And if that employee doesn't avail themselves of that, that's your defense. So if you don't do the training, there, there's kind of a misconception. People think that they're going to do the training on t Monday, and on Tuesday they'll have 15 complaints. I mean, I hope that doesn't take place. It shouldn't take place. If it does, your workplace stinks. So you need to have your employment discrimination policies. I hope, and I, and I think as we go on, we're finding more and more counties that do have legally vetted policies. Again, if you've borrowed somebody's, that's fine. You may want to have them vetted. May, make sure they're up to date. There is constantly evolving case law, and you want to make sure that, that you, your policy has the most recent language and reflects that. Um, in your policy manual, Kent's the expert on policy manuals, but you should always have that, the phrase that says that we have the right to change our policies at any time. Firing, as I said, people don't like to be fired. So they tend to be a little bit angry when, when that stuff takes place. So you wanna make sure that you're following some type of process that's gonna put you in a legally uh, valid situation. Hopefully that your, your involuntary terminations need to be improved by someone in upper management. You don't want a manager or supervisor free to just terminate somebody. Uh, 
I think it would be better if terminations were reviewed by council prior to firing. Um, make sure that you followed all the all the dotted lines and, and connected everything. Uh, oftentimes, we've been called into a situation to review something prior to a termination action being taken. And, and what, what we've counseled occasionally are things like, you can terminate, but why don't you do A, B, and C first? Okay, are terminations done for political reasons? Again, Kent, I'm setting you up here, all right? Because um, we just had a recent Madison County case, correct? And I'll have Kent talk about that a little bit more because it kind of changes everything that we've done up to this point. Um, but typically, there there have been kind of everyone kind of understood the rules in terms of uh, political hirings and firings, but that was changed at least in one county. All right. So from a risk management perspective, is there a clear understanding about who can or can't terminate employees? Because sometimes elected officials do like to overstep their bounds. I know. Can you believe it? Look at your hirings and firings and see if they're based on political affiliations. Typically, when somebody new came into office, we kind of understood that uh, at the chief chief deputy level, that was something that was uh, an opportunity for you to, to kind of clean house. But below that, typically not. Um, this is a really interesting one. We had a good discussion um, in a program once. Is there a written policy about disclosure of information about former employees to prospective employers? Do you guys have a process, if somebody were to call in and say, is John or Jane Doe, can you give me um, a recommendation for them or can you tell me a little bit about them? Do you guys, is there a central person where that, that phone call would be routed to? Okay, there should be, because they shouldn't just be able to call up anybody within the county and talk to various people and get the hubbub and get the, 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 the rumor mill going on why that employee was, was uh, and left employment. You know, they left on their own, but you know, if they weren't, they were going to be forced out. Um, I had an I had an a county tell me that they um, put on their employment application. I needed to see this thing. Um, some type of wording that said, "You give us the authority to do a background check on you, and um, we will." Basically, it was like a liability release saying we will give uh, prospective employers information on you that we deem appropriate. Uh, do, you, do you release release a small liability for from doing that? That was kind of interesting. So, in other words, they were asking up front. Not only are you going to be able to talk to everybody and get do a background check, and you I'm releasing releasing that. I'm also releasing you from telling them how much I stunk at this job once I'm gone. I thought that was kind of interesting, but, but good. Their, their, their idea behind that was they didn't want to pass on a bad employee. I talked about this. You need to look at your application and make sure it's related. It's asking information that only relates to the job. It doesn't ask anything about age, religion, national origin, or race. Again, if you don't have one, go to Staples, go to Office Depot, and pick one up. If, if you have a common job application, I, I would recommend that you have a common app. And then if you need additional information for various departments, those are addendums to that application and those are reviewed for legal uh, review also. Some departments do pre-screening pre for various things. Um, you need to look at that in terms of what screening is, is legal, what screening is appropriate. Uh, look at how references are checked, who's checking references, what you're doing with that. Uh, if you are confused on whether you can or can't look at various social media, um, there's, there's good information, and I know a lot of employers do that right now. Um, they'll look at someone's Facebook. There was, there, was an, there was some action a while back where employers were having prospective employees sign releases or even asking for their passwords to get onto their accounts. Um, and the courts have typically found that to be overstepping your bounds. If 
you can find something uh, within the public domain, you're free to do that, but you can't force an employee to give you their logon and password for their uh, Facebook account if it's hidden. What you really want to make sure is that if you are doing these background checks, are you documenting this? And as I said before, you want to look at the interviewing process. I, I suggest that you have an interview form and that you document those interviews. Um, there are various things that kind of, it, it helps to keep people on the green and, and out of the rough. Um, so they're not writing just any old comment, um, old, young, you know, inappropriate comments. And again, I, you need to be looking at having written job descriptions that are defining essential job functions. This is going to be applicable then for ADA as well as help with uh, return to work in your workers' comp program. One of the problems that we see is that employers fail to, to, to recognize that some things are actually evidence. Um, what, what we'd like you to do is, first of all, recognize it, make a copy, share it with the employee, use it as a teaching tool. If you have, if you have reviews, if you have disciplinary action, you know, it shouldn't be double secret probation. It's ought to be something that you use as a training tool. Keep a, a record of what occurred Try to give examples and review it with the employee. If you do annual employees, uh, no, I don't think I don't think anyone raised their hand. Um, one of the issues that we have with uh, annual evaluations is that people do tend to do grade inflation. So what's interesting is that when they do studies, they find that prior to employee reviews, employees are on better behavior than they were during the other 11 months of the year. So employers tend to be more favorable and think, well. You know, Johnny's really been doing a good job these past 30 days. Think about your role and think about your HR style. You, you want to, you want to, there's the friend, you want to, uh, you tend to be inconsistent. You treat, you, you, people come and they, they say, oh, you know, l listen to this, this scenario. And they tell you their story and you go, oh, that, that sounds terrible. And you, you um, try to justify what's going on. There are some folks that also view HR, they're, they're, they see it as um, uh, very, they want to make it complex. They are throwing up roadblocks for other people. Somebody comes forward and says, what can we do about this? They have questions about FMLA or FLSA and they just throw out more and more jargon and keep spinning you in a circle instead of finding answers. Um, some folks look at HR as, the, as it's made to punish uh, develops a culture of let's not even talk about this with anybody else. You know, I don't know if we're doing the right thing on uh, tracking his hours, or I don't know if we're doing the right thing here, but let's not seek any information. What we'd like to, to, to do is have a um, kind of a culture that uh, HR is a resource to other departments, and HR can be a guide through. Um, employment difficulties. So you want to develop a culture of let's ask, let's find out. If you don't know the answer, there are people that can help you find those answers. My goal in, in this short time was to say employment liabilities can be controlled. I start off with showing you how, how expensive they can be and all the litigation landmines that are out there, but they can be controlled. Um, your job as an employer is to be consistent and we'd like to see documentation. 